In the Roman Catholic Church, saints are venerated. This is an example of how spiritual ancestors can play an important role in the spiritual lives of living people today. Um, the Roman Catholic Church had turned a lot of pagan gods into saints. Um, so do some research on the gods and then see if they're connected to the Roman Catholic Church as saints. Um, it happened a lot. Many pagans believe that wand should represent air and sword should represent fire because fire would destroy the wand, but not a sword. This book follows the Rider White Smith symbolism, but this is one example of how some pagans have different uh, ways of understanding the elements and these correspondences. Um, and it can be very confusing because uh, some traditions, like they are referring to, they could have the wands and the swords different. So make sure that you uh, pay attention to any tradition that you follow. See how they're representing uh, their tools. Candles are, naturally, the best tool for working with the element fire. It's fun to make your own candle wax candles. Wax wicks and candle making kits can be found at craft stores to help you get started. Dye your candle red or whatever color represents fire in your tradition. Unscented candles are best. Um, right there it is very important. Um, different colored candles for different rituals. Um, and you see like the gold and silver candles, they represent the god and goddess. So color is important when you do candles. The other thing that you have to remember is that homemade candles are a little bit better because it's your energy. It is your energy that was involved in making them. Um, you should only use new candles whenever possible and you try to buy new candles and try to find a way where you know you think the fewest people have handled them because every person that touches them has their own energies and you could have a lot of cross-contamination because you had 40 different people handle these candles and you got to cleanse them before you use them. What power animals are most associated with the element air? Why? Birds, of course. From eagles and hawks to ravens and starlings, if a bird appears in your life, it could be an omen of something new or a lesson to be learned. Um, to me, when I go out on a trip, you know, just jump in the car and truck, go somewhere. If I see an, a hawk or an eagle or something, you know, flying by me or, you know, like on a fence post, it's like, that's good omen. That's, that's going to be a good trip. You know, I start getting nervous if I'm halfway there and I haven't seen anything, you know, like my, my hawks flying around. To bring the energies of water into your life, try keeping an aquarium filled with beautiful exotic fish. Place it in the western part of your house or in the western side of, of its room. Uh, collecting seashells can be another way to connect with this element. Uh, it doesn't have to be expensive exotic fish. Um, you can have a goldfish tank if you wanted to, okay? Um, because, you know, it's about the element and any creature would actually work. So a turtle lives in water. 
snails was water. Okay. Do you love quartz crystal? If so, you may have a strong connection to the element Earth. Place a beautiful quartz crystal in the northern quadrant of your ritual space to honor these this element. Oh, I love crystal, but there are so many wonderful stones to that you can use. Um, what I did, I love to walk out in nature and the parks and sometimes I find stones that, you know, about the size of my fist and they just scream, you know, hey, look at me, look at me. And, you know, I'd grab them and, you know, they're just beautiful. I got one rock that is just about the size of my fist and it's an agate and it's um, not quite perfectly round, but it's got a combination of greens and whites and all of that. And it, it just kind of reminded me like a primitive earth um, thing. And so that is a stone that I use to represent earth on my altar. There's much more to learn about the elements and how they can play an important part of your spiritual practice. Um, one helpful book is Margie McNair's Wisdom of the Elements, The Sacred Wheel of Earth, Air, Fire, and Water. All right. Um, it was said in my previous video, um, the Celts did not divide everything up into the basic elements of air, earth, fire, and water. They believed in the three realms, which is sky, the land, and the water. So, um, for like water, you'd have your turtles, um, some seabirds, uh, fish, some snakes. Uh, land would be like your bear. Um, bear, bison, buffalo, uh, dogs, cats, and then your air animals would be, of course, like your birds and a majority of your insects. And also, in this one, you got to remember, mountains go up in the sky pretty high, and there are some animals that live wonderfully in the ma on mountains. And so you could have a ram, you know, that lives high in the mountains actually be kind of that air land uh, representation of the three realms. Next time you say that something is silly, here's something to keep in mind. The word silly comes from the ancient word silly, S-E-L-I-E which means spiritually blessed or happy. Perhaps silliness is a spiritual virtue, after all. In the Church of the Goddess calls us to have mirth as well as reverence within us. Pagans believe in having fun. Um, we have to balance out our emotions and there are times where we must be mean and angry, but then there must be times of us being happy and full of joy. Although Astronomically, the seasons begin with the solstices and equinoxes. To pagans, the solstice and equinoxes actually represent the midpoint of each season. So, in pagan terms, winter begins on October 31st, and the solstice represents the middle of winter. The same is true for the other seasons. Spring begins on February 2nd, uh, summer on May 1st and autumn on August 1st. That also depends on what tradition you're following. Okay. The yin and yang of ritual. Oh, wait. 
edit that last little segment now. Esbats is something of a tongue twisting word. Try saying it three times fast. For this reason, many pagans simply refer to the rituals of the full and new moon as moons. This might not be as fancy or romantic of a term, but it's certainly practical. Espats are the honoring of the full or new moons, and there are 13 in every year. A modern belting custom derives from the ancient practice of driving livestock between the fires. Uh, light your own belting bonfire safely. Uh, take your sweetheart's hand in yours and run together and jump over the fire. While jumping, thinking of what it is you wish to manifest in your life. But be careful. Don't think about fertility and babies unless you really want one. Um, also, what they did in Ireland was they would have two bonfires and they would run the cattle in between them. This was a way to cleanse them and increase fertility. Not only are the phases of the moon a cycle, when the moon is full it forms a circle in the sky. Hence, the tendency of most pagan groups to do rituals in a circular space. Once again, a pagan fondness for circles and cycles is based on what may be found in nature. Um, but then again, like I said, that does not include all cultures because the Celts believed that when they are in their nematodes, their sacred groves, they did not need circles. In the popular imagination, witches, druids, and shamans all use a lot of paraphernalia to work their magic. Ritual tools are the items you will use as you develop your spiritual life as a pagan. Just imagine, just remember, the magic is in you, not the object. We make our tools, and we use them as extensions of ourselves. They work as a focus, um, so that while we're learning, we can picture the energy going through our arms and into our wands or atomes or, or what other tools we were working with at that time. But there comes a point where we don't need them, that we can do the same magic with our wands that we can without them. Wiccans perform uh, ritual in a sacred circle, an energetically created boundary between the worlds. Although this magical circus can be uh, created without any tools, most witches prefer to use an anime to focus and direct the energy used to create the circle's boundary. Other pagans may use different tools to set up their ritual, as the sample ritual. Okay. Um, each tradition is different on this, um, and I do want to give my point of view on this very, very clearly. Um, there are different um, beliefs on how to cast a circle, and there is one person I have a great deal of respect for, his name is Freak Phil, and you use both tools for create, for casting your circle. The anime is not used to actually put the circle in. If you're like using dirt and such and you're trying to put it in the ground, no, do not do that. Excuse me. <coughs> yeah, sorry. 
do not use your anime to draw into the dirt. The anime is never to cut anything in the physical form. It is only to cut, manipulate spiritual energy. So if you are using anything to cause, to put a circle in the in the dirt, use your your wand or something else. Do not use your anime. Now when you call your corners, quarters, corners, your elements, you can use both tools, yeah, but you should be using your anime. Um, they, they need to be commanded, so use your, your anime. When you're call, calling on the gods and goddesses to join you in your circle, in your ritual, use the wand. You don't point sharp things at the gods and goddesses if you want them to actually join in. Okay? Etiquette. It's an important thing in paganism. Elemental tools, like any other ritual tool, can be ornate and valuable or simple and inexpensive. Chalices, for example, can be an intricately made silver goblet or a handmade clay vessel. What you or your group use as ritual tools can be a large measure it can in a large measure be determined but as a matter of taste. Um, I see a lot of do-it-yourself um, pagans out there and they love to have something very simple. And I agree with that 100%. Um, your wands, your animes should be handmade. Um, your other tools should be something that you feel a connection with. Um, my first chalice was a an odd glass that I saw in consignment shop and I got some bluish paints and put some different shades of blue on it. Uh, dropped it and broke it unfortunately. had to get a different one. But to me I connected with that because it looked like water and it had the blues in it. When consecrating your tools, envision rainbow-colored or gold-white light um, suffusing through each object, cleansing it inside and out. Uh, that that's just self-explanatory. There, you can learn to make many ritual tools from robes to candles to incense. Pagans who enjoy making things find that making their own ritual tools is not only fun but spiritually empowering. As more of their own energy is combined in items that they make themselves. Um, like I was saying, I think it's more important that you spend the time making your own wand and such. Um, you might be supporting the economy by buying somebody's wand off of eBay or Etsy, but when you go and do the, the walk and you find the wood, that branch, and you fashion it to make your wand, you'll feel better using it than something that you bought off of eBay or Etsy. Although many pagan groups have officially designated priests and priestesses who lead rituals, it can be very bonding for a group of pagans to share leadership responsibilities. With more people contributing their energy to the ritual, it can be more quickly it can be more quickly feel like a true group effort. Um, one group that I was I interacted with a little bit um, they made the request, you know, like everybody take turns doing a ritual for the Sabbaths. Uh, they did not want the same two people doing every Sabbath while everybody else just kind of, you know, watches from the, you know, the side of the room. Um, 
And so, yeah, I agree with that 100%. Um, we have to be active to be spiritual. Many pagans experience profound shifts in consciousness when doing ritual. Others may only experience slight changes in awareness or no change at all. However you experience ritual is fine for you. If it doesn't cause you to see the goddess, keep an open mind. It takes practice, sometimes when you least expect it. A ritual can have a profound impact on your way of relating to um, consciousness and the world. If you're new to paganism, um, it's going to take time to understand everything and to be open to all these energies. So if the first couple times, you know, it's confusing or you're not really understanding, that's fine. It's, it's fine. If you keep a diary or a book of shadows, make notes in it about your ritual. Keep not only a copy of the ritual script, but also your comments on how the ritual felt. Whether it seemed to be successful in its objective or what you plan to be, plan to do differently the next time. Um, we do need to keep records of what we do. Um, my one of the people that I trust, Freak Phil, uh, he was talking about when you cast a spell, you do your ritual, you write it down in your book of shadows, and then you slam that book shut and you put it aside. And then you know, you don't think about it. The spell's been done, you put your energy out, close the book, and don't come back and, uh, for, for a couple months. Then read it and see your results. Did it work? Did it not? Okay. And I, I agree with what Freak Phil was saying. Many people have no religious affiliation, but then try to find a church to get married in. Many pagan, many Christian churches, however, either require people to join the church before they can get married there or charge large sums of money to host a wedding. Pagans, luckily, um, they do hand fastings, and we can perform these ceremonies practically anywhere. We also got to remember that a church is just a building. Our spirituality is in nature, so if we're going to do a hand fasting, nine times out of ten, it's outside. Unless it's 30 degrees below zero. If you choose to be hand-fasted in a pagan marriage ceremony, be sure to understand the legal issues surrounding the ceremony. If you want a legal wedding, you need a pagan priest or priestess who is licensed to perform weddings and you will need a marriage license in accordance with the laws of the state. As a pagan, you can opt for a spiritual hand fasting that does not have any legal status, but remember that such an arrangement doesn't give you or your spouse the legal rights of marriage. Um, as I said earlier, I am an ordained minister. I am fully allowed under the laws of 47 of the 50 states to perform a marriage ceremony. And I can tailor it to be a pagan fa hand fasting. I could try to follow a Christian. I can do a Muslim, a Jewish. I could do a Pastafarian. And they would all be legally bound. The Pagan Book of Living and Dying by Starhawk and Amacha Nightmare provides a wealth of resources and rituals related to the process of crossing over. Even if you're not planning a funeral, it's a great book because it contains a section that discusses pagan perspectives on death and dying. 
one of the bad things about Christianity, in my opinion, is that it scares too many people. We fear death. And because we fear death, we do some stupid things. So we need to learn to knock that off. Death is a part of the cycle of life. Reading about meditation is not the same as doing it. Be sure to put the book down and actually spend time sitting in silence. There you go. Practice and experience matter. Um, funny thing tonight, I scared the heck out of Cindy. Um, she was here in the computer room working on the computer, checking out her Facebook. I was in the living room. I had the lights out. I was sitting comfortably on the couch. I had my hands out, palms up. I was clearing the mind. I was meditating. She walked out. She didn't even see me. And, you know, she's going, well, where is he? Where is he? And I go, who are you looking for? Scared the heck out of her. Because, you know, you get so deep into your meditations and such, um, you kind of put a cloak around you. And when there's no lights on, sometimes you're invisible. When you commit to learning magic, you take responsibility for your own happiness and well-being. Magical, uh, magical people think it's boring to be a victim or martyr, a whiner or a complainer. Instead of dissipating your energy, feeling sorry for yourself, as a magical pagan, you take responsibility to transfer your life in positive and healthy ways. Live. That's that's the thing. Um, put the energy out and create something. Energy, uh, magic is about changing the world around you. Well, you don't always need magic to change the world around you. You just need to get the head going or get the hands going and do something. One way to understand the difference between high and low magic is to consider the different purposes behind their physical work. For ceremonialists, the purpose behind magic is to attain spiritual power and control over unseen forces. Natural magicians, however, tend to use their craft more in the service of physical healing or to help improve someone's luck when it comes to love or money. What you learn more about oh, no. What is the difference between magic and prayer? Some pagans would say there is no difference. Others might see prayer as a tool for friendly or intimate communications with the goddess and see magic as more of a business plan where you and the goddess are partners in achieving a goal. Uh, I do not agree with that part right there because of my personal beliefs that you got to have a friendly, positive relationship with the guns and if you're going to go well this is just a business plan you are creating a little bit too much of a barrier between you and the gods the choice to use divination like use of magic is a matter of personal preference among pagans some pagans don't feel drawn to these tools at all if that describes you you're not alone others however love to explore the mysteries of the astrology tarot, and other ancient arts to access intu intuitive wisdom. Tongue's not working today. It's possible to read tarot cards or use other divination tools 
without ever learning the right meaning of the symbols. If you are able to listen to your intuition, you probably can uh, use a divination tool effectively even with little or no knowledge of its traditional meanings. However, learning the meanings associated with your favorite tool can help you even be more accurate in your divination. Again, experience matters. You don't need a fancy charter deck to practice chartomancy. An ordinary deck of playing cards works just as nicely. The suits of spades, clubs, diamonds, and hearts correspond to the tarot suits of swords, wands, pentacles, and cups. Whether you use tarot or playing cards, you'll use the cards to inspire your intuitive powers, which is where the real magic of divination lies. I had a friend tell me that a person only uses one tarot deck, that they must receive it as a gift or have it, a strong connection with it. Um, that if you use multiple decks, you cannot develop the relationship. You can't really put your energy into that deck and thus your intuition with it will be lessened. That is why I have only one tarot deck, and it is the Druidcraft tarot deck. Some healers find that using a pendulum is a handy tool to access um, how open a chakra is. Simply take a small pendulum and suspend it suspend it over a person's chakra. If the chakra is close, the pendulum will either hang limply or move in a back and forth motion. When a chakra is open, the pendulum swings in a smooth circular motion. Write your affirmations on sticky notes and put them in places where you're likely to see them, such as on a bathroom mirror, near your computer monitor, and above the kitchen sink. Then, each time you see one, you'll have another reminder to put these words of power into action. Pagans tend to have a very responsible approach to power. Power is good when it helps you reach your own full potential, but it's suspect when it is used to control or oppress others. This, of course, is the same position pagans take with regard to magic. Use it for healing and personal transfer transformation, but never to harm another. Bogus. That is just bogus. Um, there are a lot of witch, traditional witch traditions that, you know, say that a witch is not above doing something or below doing something. Um, being tolerant, but not taking any crap. Um, so, it depends on your tradition, okay? Sometimes you have to harm people to protect others. Love and trust are more than just feelings. They are commitments we make to behave in positive ways towards each other, to ourselves and each other. Um, this is why in most traditions when you enter a circle you say that you enter in perfect love and in perfect trust. Some religions teach that pride is a sin. To pagans, true pride, self-esteem, is a natural part of honor. Honor assumes that healthy self-respect integrated with the positive opinion of others makes for a happy and virtuous life. We live honorably when we live in the ways that we and that other members of our tribe can be proud of. 
ego is not a sin. You can have a strong ego and be happy, and it's fine as long as you don't use your ego to impose on others. Leave it to Beaver, a popular 1950s television show, portrayed a happy suburban family with a dad named Ward and a mom named June. Ward and June symbolize the traditional heterosexual marriage favored by most religions. Although many pagans live in traditional heterosexual marriages, nearly all pagans believe it's okay for mature adults to choose other sexual options. That's, of course, if you believe that homosexuality is a choice. Um, I think people are born, you know, heterosexual or homosexual, and I support whatever choice you ha you make. Well, my rule is, if you are a homosexual guy, we'll get along just fine as long as you don't grab my ass. The responsibility of solitary paganism involves strict self-discipline. As a solitary, you must make and keep your own agreements about how you'll live the pagan life. If you enjoy being alone and can adhere to your own discipline, you'll probably find the rewards of solo practice to be deeply fulfilling. This I agree with 110%. I am kind of a disciplinarian and I have my code of ethics and so I enjoy following my rules sometimes it means I have to say I'm sorry I can't do this but you know I can I can live happily that way and some people don't like it but people know where I stand I just think that there's a oh excuse me I think there are a lot of people that don't have a set set of ethics. Many people feel drawn to starting their own pagan group. If you and several friends are interested, you can find books to help you get started, such as Wicked Covens, How to Start and Organize Your Own by Judy Haro. The downside is that if you no one in your group has experience with pagan community. You will be reinventing the wheel, so if possible, find an existing group of experienced pagans who can share their wisdom with you. Um, read Living Wicca also. Um, it talks about creating your own tradition. Um, I've quoted that book quite a bit in my videos. A pagan gathering with 500 participants at a remote campground can be a powerful, spiritually moving experience, but it also can be overwhelming to someone new to nature of um, spirituality. Ease your way into the pagan community. Look for a small group in your area to participate in before going to large regional or national gatherings. Yes, if you are new, going to these large groups, especially if you don't know what to expect, can be very overwhelming. Um, my first um, group event was the Samhain event, and you know I was in the costume and all that, and then you know saying, "Do you want to join a ritual?" And you know I never did ritual before, so it was scary. So take your time, and you're going to have to do a lot of research before you get involved into some of these things. Many rituals and meditation go together nicely. Experiment with ways to, in which you can honor Mother Nature and spend time in meditation on a daily basis and unified personal ceremony. One thing that I do is um, when I go to work, um, as I walk out to my truck, I will look at the sky 
and you know, I'll make a comment, you know, about how beautiful things are because you know, I look at the stars. And then when I get in the truck, you know, I start her up and I take a few minutes and I it's not meditative, but I clear the mind, I relax, do some deep breathing exercises, and I get ready for the day, but it's kind of like the come to peace and get ready for my day. Most pagans recommend picking your patron and matron deities from the same pantheon. When you mix and match gods from different cultures, they may not always get along energetically. For that matter, try to avoid working with deities who, according to tradition, don't like each other. That energy of conflict could sabotage your own spirituality. And again, this is why I say we should only work with one pantheon and because of there are um, stories um, that can conflict if you are mixing and matching. More than anything else, um, your parents want you to be ha happy and safe. When telling them about your spiritual choices, make a point in telling them that you are perfectly safe and entirely happy following in the footsteps of the God and Goddess. Even if they won't admit it, this reassurance will likely help them accept your path. Um, there are a lot of videos out there on YouTube talking about um, going down to the broom closet. I would watch all of them. Uh, because if you're still in the broom closet and you're wanting to know how to handle it, there's some good advice out there. Remember to set limitations using the internet. If you're looking for information on a particular subject, the internet might be the best place to do the research. However, you also need to turn off the computer and go spend time outdoors with the trees, soil, the sky. Ultimately, that's the most important place to practice the pagan path. Yes, um, the computer is great. You can do a lot on the computer. Yes, you got your social networks. But sometimes you got to turn it all off, take off the shoes, and walk outside. That is what's important. All right. Well, those are the oracle points. Um, basically, little tips in your pagan path. Um, I enjoyed that a great deal. It kind of reminded me of some things and, you know, confirmed you know a lot of things that I feel and think when I watch all these videos that are on YouTube so I hope you enjoyed this video um, the unedited version is an hour and 24 minutes long so <laughs> this is probably going to be put into two videos so everybody take care be at peace